Uh, I'm a pediatric neurologist and uh, I'm at Sutter Health in California. And this is how you find me, sarahshayette.com. And I'm an author of Winning with ADHD, of ADHD and the Focus Mind, and a little comic book that we just wrote called ADHD and Me. So what I'm gonna talk about first is sort of the fact that ADHD is biological. There is biology behind all this behavior. Um, the basics are that it can involve the prefrontal lobes, which are like right here behind your forehead bones. It involves dopamine and norepinephrine, and that these types of systems overlap other types of um, neuropsychiatric issues. Uh, autism is one where there's a lot of genetics that are probably common to both things. So again, I can't you know, give a huge presentation on this, but I want you to look at the pictures here and look at that there is a lot of the brain that's involved and there's different parts of the brain that are involved in different parts of paying attention. Some parts are about prioritization or executive functioning. Basically, that's what I call the mom part of the brain, the part that says do this first, then that, here's what you're gonna do. Um, other parts of it have to do with, you know, distractibility, and that's where the green parts are that we think of. The more teal, light blue, I guess that is, um, uh, are the parts that are involved in hyperactivity. And finally, uh, impulse control is the dark blue areas. But the main thing is that a lot of the brain is involved here. Um, so that was the anatomy of the brain. Here's the chemistry that we're talking about. We're talking about two different chemicals that are found in, in again, you can see that these are affected in a lot of the brain. These are um, uh, dopamine and norepinephrine, and they are two of the major um, uh, transmitters, meaning the way brain cells communicate with one another. So I'm gonna talk about medications, and the first question is when to do medications. Medications are gonna affect those brain chemistry systems. They are optional. That is, this is not like heart disease or diabetes, unless you're being inattentive behind the wheel of a car or super impulsive doing dangerous things. This ADHD is not a danger to life and limb. Um, so it's not a health issue in that respect. But, you know, when people consider them is when they're not getting anywhere with the behavioral strategies. Some people consider them when they're in crisis, when there's nothing else they can think of doing and they're about to be kicked out of school or lose their jobs or um, dropping out or whatever it is. When people lose their hope, when their ability to set goals is impaired because their self-esteem has been battered by ADHD, that's another time when people consider medication uh, falling behind academically or in dangerous situations, bolting out, doing things without thinking. We're talking about teenagers with drugs and, and sex and jumping off of things that they shouldn't jump off of. There are basically two major categories of FDA approved medications. The first are the stimulants um, and the second are the non-stimulants. The stimulants are used most of the time because they overall work better than anything else. Their names are the ones that most people have heard of, Ritalin, Adderall, Vyvanse, and Focalin. And there are many variations within those. So a lot of them have both short and long acting forms. The non-stimulants are Intuniv, Stratera, and Capve. Finally, people also use non-FDA approved treatments in certain situations, and those would be Wellbutrin, Provigil, and Nuvigil. The stimulants work right away, and they work better than the non-stimulants for most people. So that makes them very popular. They work about 95% of the time. Um, and I would say the major side effects are things like 
um, worse sleep, worse appetite, or worse mood. For some people, they can worsen ticks. They do not cause seizures. Um, we do need to monitor blood pressure, pulse, height, and weight. Um, but they're safe medicines. I send people to cardiologists sometimes to get checked out if there's any heart concerns, but I've been doing this for so many years, I can still count on the fingers of one hand um, situations where cardiologists said not to take them. Um, I can also say that although they're stimulants and some of them are in the methamphetamine category, they are not addictive at the doses that we give them and they do not lead to addiction. People can abuse them should they so desire, but that's different from being addictive. We use non-stimulants about 5% of the time because the stimulants work most of the time. These have to build up. They should be taken every day. Unlike the stimulants, they don't wear off at the end of the day, but they're there 24-7. They also can have different side effects. These are not like better side effects are just a little different. If you have kids with severe tics or Tourette syndrome, these generally do not worsen tics and they can improve tics. In terms of which stimulant to choose, you need to know that they are um, all pretty similar in terms of effectiveness and they all can give side effects. So there isn't one that's better than the other. The main difference is how long they last. So some of them last three or four hours, some of them last closer to 10. Also, what's covered by insurance is a big deal because if you can get focused for like $10, that's better than getting focused for $300 a month every month. And the thing about it, there's so many of them um, that even little differences in release make a big difference. And I'm gonna talk more about that in the upcoming slides. So, um, you know, I'm going to say that the word stimulant gets a bad rap, but this is not drugs that you buy on the street. This is a FDA approved, very well regulated medication. I'm going to point out that caffeine is also a stimulant and I can't do without my caffeine. Um, I'm also going to point out that methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, um, the medications that are based on that are not amphetamines. They are those things, which I can't pronounce, but they are um, not amphetamines. Adderall is an amphetamine, but like I said, um, at the doses that we give, they do not activate the reward pathway in your brain that you need certain chemicals that will cause addiction. And we just don't get that with these medications. So there's two major categories of stimulants. There's the methylphenidate base and there's the amphetamine base. And within each category, there are many, many choices. And, you know, for example, take methylphenidate based, there's many different long acting methylphenidates. And depending on how that particular way that that medicine is released in your child's body or your body, you might have different benefits and different side effects. Some people I think can take any of these and some people are very, very, it's like the princess and the pea. So like I said, some of them last for just a few hours, some of them are much longer, and some of them depend on how they're released. So on this slide, um, I want to um, draw your attention to where it says long, and you'll see that Ritalin LA, which is one of the long-acting Ritalins, is released 50% in the morning and 50% four hours later the next two have different release proportions. So that's just an example of different ways that they're released. And the slide says, and then there's Journey because this is a newer product. I haven't actually used it. You take it at nighttime and it's supposed to be working in the morning when your child or you wake up, but it's been too expensive and uh, I'm afraid of waking people up in the middle of the night. So I've been hanging back on that one. Um, you know, there's different forms and the point is that some of them have to be swallowed whole, some of them are sprinkled, some can be crushed, there's patches, liquids, chewables, and meltaways. So getting it into somebody should not be a problem. And Focalin is related to methylphenidate. Some people who do well on Ritalin don't do well on Focalin and vice versa. And there's different forms of Adderall, for example. And just like I had shown you on the previous slide, the ratios of 
what's in the Adderall and how it's released can be different. And so there's also something called Vyvanse or dexamphetamine, and these are related to Adderall. And just like with the Ritalin and Focalin, some people who do well on this don't do well on the Adderall and vice versa. Um, the idea is to start with low doses. If people hate them, you can stop them immediately. Um, but the higher the dose, the better the effects, but the more side effects you can have. If one stimulant doesn't work, then you try another one. Um, if you're kind of running out of stimulants, you could try the non-stimulants. So the non-stimulants, I think Intuniv helps with impulsive behavior, not so much attention. Stratera is the best alternative for attention. They just are coming out with another one that's almost the same as Stratera. I don't know if it'll be better or not. It will be more expensive. Capve is kind of like Intuniv, but again, more expensive, so I rarely use it. And just remember that there's other ish, other things you can do. There's sleep issues, anxiety, depression, tutoring um, to make somebody feel better. Um, you know, sports or artwork or other things that help with self-esteem, organizational help. All of this helps people focus as well. And there's other treatments too that have nothing to do with it. There's neurofeedback. Um, the latest thing is what they call digital therapy, which is like video games that are supposed to help with attention. And there's a device called TNS, which you strap on at night and it zaps your brain and it's supposed to help with attention. And this is you know, a picture of a book that I wrote for teenagers with a teenager. This is a book that I wrote with my kid's karate teacher, plus my husband, who's a psychiatrist. And we talked about the behavioral strategies that athletes use and how to apply them to ADHD. We won some awards on that, which is pretty cool. But the main thing we talked about in those books is the problem of intention. How do you get somebody to focus naturally? Thank you very much. That was very informative and I appreciate you sharing that information. We've had questions rolling in already. Oh um, <laughs> people are excited. So I'm going to start with the first one. That is, um, my girls and I are new to this. I'm 52 and they are young adults. Um, how do we know what the right dosage is? I have concerns about going up in dosage um, because I guess there's some uh, also some co-occurring bipolar perhaps. Yeah. So how can they get past that? Um, start at a really low dose, especially if you're 52, like you could be inattentive for another few minutes and it would be okay. So there's no huge hurry. Start at a tiny dose and you can always increase. So, um, uh, you know, you can chip off a little tiny bit of a pill if you want to. Um, you, you know, if it doesn't work, you can always chip off a bigger piece the next day. The next question is, is it okay to drink coffee with medication? Yes, it is. Um, some people have side effects um, that they wouldn't otherwise have if you're adding stimulants together like caffeine and Adderall or caffeine and Ritalin. A lot of people are just fine. So, um, you know, if, if you're having side effects, it probably means you shouldn't do that. Some people can certainly reduce their amount of stimulant or amount of caffeine um, when they add a stimulant in. They make people more awake in general. Um, as a parent, we get stuck in the chicken egg talk about where to start. Is it behavior work or meds? It seems that acute issues may be better helped by meds to bring behavior into a range to work on behavior management capacity building. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, so that's a really complicated question. And um, I can't really answer specific to your child because there's lots of things that are, um, you know, like how long you've been working at it and what results you've shown and what the problems are that you're trying to fix in the first place. Um, but uh, it's often the combination of medications and behavioral treatment that are uh, it works the best, um, but getting your child to buy in will help with the medication too. So, um, 
uh, a lot of times people will either work with a therapist or um, somebody who can help parents parent um, and figure out what works for your particular child. There's definitely a role for the non-medication strategies, but there are people who, you know, they keep the strategies aren't working because either they can't be implemented properly or the child is way too inattentive. I mean, there are people who walk in the office and I'm like, oh my gosh, you really need this medication. And uh, there are other people who it's like, no, why don't you try some other things? So, um, uh, you know, I don't think it's the biggest question you'll ever face as to whether you're gonna start medication, um, but the whole philosophy is if what you're doing isn't working, please try something else. Uh, can lamotrigine be used as monotherapy for preteen or adolescent with combined type ADHD? Okay, so lamotrigine is a, and you did a very excellent job. I'm gonna <laughs> Thank you. Off. That was a new one for me. I hadn't heard of that, that particular yeah. medication. It's also called lamictal, and it started out as a seizure medicine, and it's still used as a seizure medicine. It then went to bipolar. So it is for mood regulation and it is not for the purpose of increasing your attention. So, um, you know, if your mood is going crazy, you're not gonna be able to pay attention very well. Um, your brain has two different parts, let's say. It's got the emotional part and it's got the thinking part. And if the emotional part is going crazy with anxiety or depression or whatever, mania or whatever emotional thing, it's going to turn off the thinking part, which is the part that is focus and attention. So, um, uh, you know, the only way lamotrigine is going to help focus is if the focus is as a result of out of control moods. How do you handle um, children who are transitioning into adulthood and may be reluctant to to use their medications or they think they don't need them anymore. Well, I would hope that you could figure this out in a safe space. So, you know, while your child is home, um, you know, basically these medicines are things that your child has to agree to take. Otherwise, when they go to their independence, if that's at college, they, they're not gonna take it if they don't want to. So try off. The medication when your child is at home. Let them, you know, talk about what you're going to look for, what they're going to look for. Maybe they'll do better than you think. Um, maybe they won't, in which case let's try to make it obvious to them. Um, you know, for college, basically you got to tell your child that I'm betting a semester's worth of tuition that you're going to go to college and not be on your video games. You're going to go to college and hand in your work. You're going to study for tests more than five minutes before the test starts. So, you know, uh, if you don't think your child is going to do that, I'd encourage you not to fork out $40,000 or whatever it's going to be for a semester's tuition. It's a bet. So make sure that your child can demonstrate the ability to handle himself before you bet that money. Okay, the next question comes from Dana. She asks, um, in your experience, how different do children do on Vyvanse if they can't tolerate uh, Adderall extended release? Yeah, great question. It's not the same medicine and your child may very well do fine on Vyvanse if they're not doing well on Adderall extended release. All I can say is because of individual metabolism that we cannot see, nor can we test for, so don't you go be paying $300 for those gene tests because they don't work very well. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's a trial and error and that's the honest truth. Um, this is kind of a piggyback on that previous question that I had about uh, medication uh, refusal. Um, the, the mom or dad states that um, their son is newly diagnosed with ADHD and um, his medication is making him feel nauseous all the time and he's refusing to take it anymore. Should they try different ads or um, make adjustments or, or what do you suggest? So if they're taking it with food, 
um, and they have super benefits to it, that's a shame. But there's so many other medications. Try a different one that's in the same category. It may be released enough so that you don't get, or may be released differently enough so that you don't get the side effects. As my child ages, will she need a higher dosage of stimulant medication? So the stimulant medicines are not based on per pound. I could say in general, huge people need higher doses than smaller people, but not necessarily. As your child grows, her brain is also hopefully growing too. And you know her ambition and her will to succeed and her ability to organize. So while some people do need boosts in their dose, that's not a guarantee and it may not be the case with your child. Do you think that there is any um, connection related to medication and sleep, or do you think that's a symptom of the ADHD, or maybe both? Yeah, so um, uh, for, for sleep, sometimes it's hard to know. There is a higher amount of sleep problems in ki kids and adults with ADHD, and that's apart from the medication. The sleep problems can worsen or mimic the symptoms of ADHD. So if you think that sleep is an issue, you may want to talk to your doctor and uh, consider talking to a sleep specialist. But the medications can worsen sleep at times. Um, sometimes they make people feel more sleepy, but usually stimulants make it harder to get to sleep, like caffeine. So um, sometimes it's hard to know, but it can be either way. My son has tried quite quite a few medications and some seem to work for a bit, then not work. He's quite small for his age, so he's always at the same max dosage. How long would you recommend to stay on each medication if they're not seeing results? Okay, so if we're talking about the stimulant medicines, they work very quickly. And if you're not getting any benefits, you pretty much know that day. You know, you might have to adjust the dose. But some days are better and some days are worse for people always. So I would, you know, stay on it for a couple, three weeks. Sometimes people feel like the, you know, benefits appear a little bit later. Um, but you don't need to stay on this for more than a month before you figure out whether it's working or not. And it could be uh, quite a bit shorter. Um, as a follow up to that question, um, should there be a period of uh, time between changes in medication or um, do they go to their doctor and immediately try a new medication to see if that works better? Or should yeah. they no, the non-stimulants may take a few days to wash out, but the stimulants, you can detect them in the blood with a blood test or in the urine with the urine test, but they're basically out of your system. They're ineffective. They're at such a low dose, they don't do anything at that point. So go ahead and stop one one day and start another the next. Um, are the ADHD or ADHD meds for life? Oh, golly. I'm just trying to get through the day, folks, um, and the week and the month and the year. So these are not health medicines. So it's always optional, which means you can stop them at any point. Life changes. Sometimes life gets more complicated. Sometimes you develop better strategies. So you don't need to think about life. You can think about this month or this year. You can think about a block of time. Uh, question is, I have started my 11-year-old on Vilvent, Vilvent? <laughs> for inattentive oh, yeah. ADHD. There's a lot of new ones out that I'm not, not uh, up to speed on. The pronunciation, I apologize. Um, we have titrated up to 8 milligram or 40 milligrams without significant side effects. Uh, the teachers have noticed improvement with attention in a small group session, but he still has difficulty focusing in class, um, like while taking notes and answering questions. Should they continue with that medication or try a different type of medication? So, you know, I don't know your son's age or weight, but the general principle is that if there's no side effects, you can probably go higher on the dose. And some people have these livers that metabolize things crazy good. So it's like you're pouring it in and their liver is metabolizing it out so fast that you could literally throw a bucket of Quillivant at that person and 
they are like, what, am I on medicines? And some people, uh, you know, take a drop of it and uh, they are like, oh my God, this is terrible, the side effects. So that's differences in different metabolism. So um, talk to your doctor, but you probably could go up on the dose. Um, do you have any recommendations for finding specialists because they may not be able to find somebody in their own country that would work remotely? Do you have, um, do you have any recommendations on finding people who will I'm afraid it, I don't, except for to say that ADHD is present in all countries and there's a lot of resources online. Um, so uh, that's a tough one if you can't find anyone in your entire country and what's available for treatment is different in different countries, but try going online and getting educated. Chad being a wonderful resource, but there are also resources that are individual to individual countries. My teenager is very hyper and doesn't realize that he's running or vigor vigorously walking nonstop. However, he can sit and play video games for hours if I let him. Uh, should I allow him to have unlimited screen time if that's what calms his mind and prevents him from constantly running? Yeah, no. Um, unlimited screen time is a terrible idea. He should not have any more recreational screen time than he does with exercise, art, music, reading. Unlimited screen time is bad for your brain and it's bad for focusing um, for many reasons. And uh, so, no, um, I'm not a believer in too much screen time. Uh, the next question comes from Melissa. Um, she asks in regards to the different trial and errors, uh, you know, the process that your child has to go through to finding the right dose. How do you make them feel more comfortable with the idea of going through this process? Like there's light at the end of the tunnel and that they're not some sort of science experiment um, and, and avoiding that whole frustration through the process. So those are great words to use. My goodness, there's light at the end of the tunnel and your doctor's done this before and sometimes we get it right right away and sometimes it takes more time. Um, that's just the way it is. And so I think the more honest you can be, the more you let your child know that her opinion matters, um, I think you'll have a better experience. Do you think that private colleges um, will give the skills needed to succeed versus going to a public university? Not particularly. Um, you know, if you don't have the skills needed to succeed, I'd encourage you not to pay for private college. Um, they can give accommodations, but in college, you know, your child is rightly expected to bring something to the table. So depending on how impaired you're talking about, you can't look at the educational system to fix it. They can accommodate, but your child needs to have some, you know, skills and uh, willingness to apply them before I pay for any private college. The next question comes from Trina. She's asking, what is the likelihood of a child growing out of ADHD in their teenage or um, young adulthood? Well, I cannot give you a percentage. Um, I can say that the more your child has sort of a good attitude and a solve problems attitude, the less their ADHD will bother them. But as adults, you know, you have a lot more choice as to what to do. If you have severe ADHD, you may not be a librarian or something that takes a lot of sitting and wrote work. You may be a salesperson or a venture capitalist or something exciting or fireman or something that gets you moving. So it's not necessarily whether the ADHD is gone, it's how you adapt to it. The next question comes from Angela. She's asking whether or not you think that drug holidays like during the summers or weekends is something that you should do or should not do. Completely optional. With the stimulants you can go on, you can go off. And it may depend on what you're doing. If you're in a summer academic program, you may want it to be on. If you're at summer camp and looking at your toesies as you're about to hop in the pool, I do not think you need to be on your medicine. Um, if your child has such significant behavior problems that the medicine helps and they're out of control without it, feel free. 
it's really optional. We just have a few more questions left. Um, this question comes from Susan. She's asking, uh, my college student just started taking Vyvanse and sometimes feels like her heart is racing. Is this normal? Um, it sounds unpleasant. It's not normal, but it's it happens. Uh, if she's on caffeine also, she might want to cut that out. She may want to talk to her doctor about the dose. Maybe a slightly lower dose might be good enough. Um, but a little heart racing might be okay. So, um, uh, you know, anxiety can make your heart race. So a lot to think about. But if it's a problem, try something that's similar to Vyvanse, but may not have those side effects. Thank you very much. All right, this is our last question for today. Uh, this comes from Dana. Uh, what advice do you have for parents to inform insurance of medication trials so that they cover multiple medications if necessary within shorter periods of time until the right dose or medication is identified? Uh, boy, we struggle with insurance companies all the time. It is so frustrating. Um, usually you're not telling them what to do. They're telling you what to do, which is not, not good, but basically they usually have a certain set of medications that they cover and some that you have to ask them to cover and present a justification for. They may cover those, but it may cost you more anyways. And there are some that they just are not covering. So um, I would sort of say, have your doctor handle this and they should know what to do. Um, so thank you uh, for providing us with great information and resources and tips. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. We appreciate you being here.